Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's In Conversation, in which the artist Ian Davenport is speaking with art critic and author Elizabeth Fullerton about the challenges of 2020, of which there's been a few, the artist's unique painting process and his current exhibition at Kasman. My name is Mariska Nietzman. I'm a senior director at Kasman Gallery. I've worked closely with Ian for the past few years, having long been familiar with his work for over 20. I have the pleasure of introducing Ian and Elizabeth today, and I'll be back at the end of the talk to pose some of your questions to our speakers. You can use the chat function or the Q&A at the bottom of your screen to send these over during the course of the conversation. This event is in celebration of Ian's ongoing solo exhibition entitled Sequence here at the gallery in New York, where I happen to be today, unlike our speakers. The exhibition brings together large scale paintings and works on paper, several of which were made by Ian in his studio in London during the months of lockdown. The exhibition is open through January 9, and you can schedule your visit online at kasmangallery.com. These digital events are hosted under the umbrella of Kasman Verso, a multimedia editorial series that aims to offer a deeper insight into the work and practice of the gallery artists. To access a captioned recording of this event, please check back on our Vimeo page next Tuesday or email info at kasmangallery.com to request a link once published. Let's get on with the introductions. First, Mr. Ian Davenport studied at the famed Goldsmiths College of Art in London and was nominated for the Turner Prize in 1991. His work is included in many public collections such as the Arts Council in the UK, British Council Collection, the Tate in London, the British Museum in London, FNAC in France, the Central Pompidou in Paris, Museum of Modern Art in New York, Rose Museum in Massachusetts, and the Dallas Museum of Art in Texas. Davenport has ex exhibited internationally over the past three decades. Most recently in 2018, he had a major solo show at the Dallas Contemporary. His first extensive monograph was published by Thames and Hudson in 2014. And his monumental painting, Giardini Colorfall, a single painting spanning 45 feet, was featured within the Giardini of the 57th Venice Biennale in 2017. Elizabeth Fullerton is an art critic and author based in London. Her book, Art Rage, the Story of Brit Art Revolution, which features Ian's work, was published by Thames and Hudson in 2016 and is the first independent history of the young British artists, also known as the YBAs. And she's currently working on its second edition. She also contributed to a number of books on art and architecture, most recently, Flying Too Close to the Sun, The Art of the Erotic, and Body of Art all of which were published by Fiden. Elizabeth is a contributor to a variety of publications, including Art in America, Art News, Elephant, The Guardian, Apollo, and The Financial Times. And now, Elizabeth, Ian, I hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariska. It's lovely to be here with you all today. The last time I saw Ian in person was in 2016 at the launch of my book uh, on the Young British Artists, in which he featured prominently, as Mariska mentioned. Um, Ian was one of the original exhibitors in the fabled show Freeze, organized by Damien Hurst in 1988 while still a student. That show launched the group uh, onto the first the British stage and then the international stage and really did start something of a revolution in the way art was shown and promoted in England. Ian has shown incredible inventiveness in constantly coming up with new ways to apply paint to a canvas or to panel and we'll be talking about all of this in the course of our discussion. So to start with, I wanted to say firstly, congratulations on the show, Ian. It looks fabulous. Um, I'm guessing that you spent most of the lockdown period uh, in preparation. And I really wanted to ask you to start with um, how the lockdown was for you. Um, I, I think on a personal level, I mean, it was very difficult, you know, missing friends and not seeing family and, and people and um, that kind of isolation and remoteness is, is really strange and, and not very uh, something that anybody's used to. From a creative point of view, it was really good because it meant that I could uh, just concentrate on painting and um, you know and, and just focus on on my work. So um, it kind of really took me back to sort of basics in a way. I had to 
you know, there wasn't people in the studio, there wasn't galleries phoning, and um, you know, I could just concentrate on being creative, which is which was really, you know, which was actually a great joy. So I, I think there was things, there was kind of works that I'd been, that had, I'd had uh, sort of wanted to develop and I hadn't really had the opportunity before, so it gave me a bit more time. Also, I just kind of made a real mess. I think for eight weeks, I was just kind of like hoofing around in my studio. <laughs> there was stuff everywhere, paint all over the floor. And I just had quite a, you know, quite a, a lot of fun. Then I really start to miss friends and stuff. So then it, you know, then it was it kind of the strangeness of the whole thing kind of um, hit me. So it was, it was a bit. I think every, like everybody, I've had really good days and bad days with it. But I think you know, in terms of the um, of making an exhibition, actually, it was a real pleasure, and it it was great just to concentrate on the pieces for the show. I spent a lot of time thinking about you know what the paintings going to were going to be. Uh, and you know how that show was going to be laid out. So I spent a lot of time with the gallery, looking at the individual works for the show. Um, I think you know one of the prominent pieces for the show was called Blue Bonnet, and um, which is sort of I believe being shown on the screens now, and um, it's kind of like a central piece for the for the exhibition. And um, you know, uh, I mean that was sort of very much at the beginning of our discussions about the show. This was sort of a key painting. To have in the exhibition and sort of the central central work, but alongside that there were a kind of other more pictorial experimentations, sort of playing around with the. I mean, the, the show's called Sequence, so there was a lot of experimentation with with sequencing colours and the uh, the way that colours were orchestrated and put together. Um, so yeah, I think um, you know it was, it was really it was it was sort of different in a way working planning a show much more actually we did a lot of things using photoshop and models and so on to, to sort of really um think about how the show was going to be installed um probably knowing that i wasn't going to be able to come over to, to um new york and and that was just really bizarre hanging in an exhibition using a telephone <laughs> it was a really weird thing so um but I, I, you know i'm very pleased with the way it looked it was me and mariska had a quite a nod <laughs> conversation for an hour moving things I think we tried everything in every possible wall and then we were kind of like, all right so we're back to pretty much plan A then but um you know it's but the whole thing great was, though it looks it looks really really beautiful and very yeah. elegant um, a few around, but it was good I, I wanted to ask um going back to blue bonnet um spring blue bonnet um because I I know that you uh were inspired with that by seeing clusters of bluebells during a walk in the English countryside and I wanted to ask you, even though your work is ostensibly abstract, it does derive often from things that you've observed in the world. Um, and I wondered how you see your relationship to abstraction. Um, well, I mean, in terms of uh, inspiration, I think, you know, just sort of like things staying in, I mean, I'm inspired and I kind of work a lot with materials and how materials work. And, I, and as you've sort of mentioned, I use quite a lot of different inventive techniques. But also, I think I need to have things to react to outside of that as well. So, um, and sometimes uh, that can be a walk or it can be a, a sort of a, a, an architectural site that I've visited and, and liked and have been uh, have reacted to. But this particular painting was inspired by um, a bluebell field in Kent in, in uh, the UK. And the, the flowers in this, um, in this field, uh, in this forest, are, are just striking of this beautiful blue colour and, and when you walk into the forest you're just struck by this sensation of almost floating it's it's really kind of surreal so I took lots of photographs of, of the um, of the wood and then when I came back to the studio I started mixing colours based on on the, that experience and, and what I had seen and, and that is the basis for this work so quite often a sort of a real life experience will will trigger a painting um, so I, I think, you know, I'm, I, I think it's really important that the paintings have as well, you know, they can be me messing around with Photoshop, me playing around with um, cutting things up and collaging them, all sorts of different things. I'm just, I'm just looking to kind of surprise myself in some ways as well. Ah. Um, and in recent years, um, you've drawn a thread back to some of your favourite painters or paintings by incorporating their palette into your contemporary abstract works. Um, cool. For instance, in this show, there's a work inspired by Bonnard's Nude in the Bath from 1936. Um, could you talk a bit about these personal homages and this one in particular? 
I mean, yeah, I think that, again, I, uh, there was a certain point when I was um, making the, this sort of recent body of paintings where I just kind of felt that the color choices were becoming a bit predictable uh, for me. And I, and I needed to just sort of uh, mix it up a bit. And I, I was looking at different sources for, for how that might work. And I was talking to uh, my wife, Sue, who's also an artist, and she was sort of saying, well, why don't you, you know, pick paintings you really like? You like artists, you like art. Why don't you have a look at some of your favorite paintings and sort of use them as a trigger? And I thought, mm, it's a bit of a, not a very good idea that. But um, I, I did, you know, start doing it. And actually I was really surprised. Some, some things really, really worked. Um, the first time it worked was um, a Van Gogh painting. And um, I was really struck by the way that he was using blues and oranges and playing around with complementary colors. And it was a sort of masterclass in the way that one can do that. Um, but specifically with the painting that we're looking at now, the Bonnard painting, um, it's, uh, you know, very, uh, kind of struck by the way that Bonnard's paintings are sort of um, the colours are really fuzzy and they, 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 your eye sort of flickers all over the surface of them and something similar happens in my paintings too but um, this, this particular painting is from um, a painting I saw at the Tate last year in the Bonnard exhibition and I took lots of photographs of it and you know came back to the studio and I was you know, just really enjoyed the sort of the turquoises and oranges and blues. And, um, you know, my, my painting isn't really a, um, I'm, I'm not trying to sort of replicate the Bonnard. I'm trying to trigger something else, trigger a new painting. And my painting, I think I, I like the sort of idea of it having a memory of that, you know, of the, of the source, but it's not trying to replicate that in any particular way. Um, and I just find it really, I, I find it works very well because it means my colour choices are much more um, specific. They have kind of something about them. You're, you're aware that they're being taken from something. They're just so nuanced and individual. Um, and what I tend to do is to work on smaller sort of colour studies that are quite intuitive um, and mixing the colours from, from this source painting. And then I'll just select certain areas which I, which I feel are working and start to put them together in and choreograph in the way where I feel it kind of plays out with the drama of, of a particular work. So kind of taking those bits together, almost like a, um, a musician will sort of like have phrases, musical phrases that they like to kind of make something, compose something larger. So that's the sort of way that I think about it really. Well, interesting you mentioned music because you yourself are a musician, aren't you? And you have a drum set and a guitar in your <laughs> studio at all times. And yeah. I wanted to, um, yeah, I wanted to ask about the role of music in your, in your work, actually. Well, I think, I mean, anybody looking at my paintings will be struck by the sort of rhythmic element in them. You know, a lot of my, probably the paintings I'm best known for are the, like the one we're looking at now with these kind of um, chord lines of colour. And there's a, sort of, there's, a, there's a sort of pulsing rhythm to them that is, um, you know, very evident in those pieces. And I, and I really think a, a drummer is probably, you know, one of the few people who make a painting like this, you know, it just has this sort of innate kind of like very steady beat that kind of goes through it and it anchors the colour. Um, and, you know, I'm interested in that relationship. I mean, I think people talk a lot about abstract painting and rhythm and music. So it can become a little bit cliche, but, you know, I think, I think it really is just something that I've always been drawn to. And when I was a kid, my mum bought me a tin drum when I was about four. And um, I just kind of beat the hell out of it for a day and then sort of weirdly it disappeared. And I wasn't allowed a, a drum kit for about eight years. And then I managed to persuade them after years and years and years to get trying to get me a drum kit. So, um, you know, I played in bands uh, and things as a teenager and then as an adult sort of, it, as a kind of hobby really, you know, I'm not a particularly, you know, I never really wanted to do it professionally. But I find it feeds into, into my work a lot. And so having musical instruments in the studio means that I can sort of, I can, if I need to have a break, I can step back and do something else. And um, often when I'm painting, I, I, you know, if I, if I want to kind of keep that sense of focus going, I will, um, you know, I'll sit and play the guitar and look at a painting and, and just, it just keeps my sort of concentration levels uh, at a certain point, you know, and then I can go back to the painting and there isn't this drop. Um, but yeah, I think music, it, music and art, and uh, there, there, there's a very close relationship, I think, between them. Mm -hmm. 
And um, and what about the splatter works? Because I hadn't seen those before um, since it's quite a new series. And I really love how they break up the verticality of the stripes. They work very well ju juxtaposed with them. Um, can you talk about the genesis of those works? Well, these, I mean, these sort of came from um, a, a group of uh, workshops that I did with some uh, children um, at the Icon Gallery a few years ago. And um, it, it was a sort of, uh, it was a school, school trip and they came to the gallery and, and I had this idea about making some stripe paintings with the kids. And there was two kids who were just sort of messing about and were squirting each other in the face and sort of really being rather naughty. So I thought rather than try and kind of get them to do what I want them to do, I just thought, okay, right, well, let's just go a bit mental and, and uh, sort of start making all these splatter marks. And the kids had a great time. And I was really struck by the energy and the marks that they were making and, you know, how dynamic they were. And again, it was using a syringe, and, but they were making all these beautiful marks. There was all these kind of splinters of colour and, you know, all these really um, elaborate details in the, in the things that they were doing. But they had also got incredibly dirty and mucky and everything had looked brilliant at a certain point and then it had all gone brown. So I'd had to sort of talk to them a little bit about colour. And when I came back to my studio, I thought, OK, well, there's some way that I can utilise that experience and try and sort of make something more of it. And to begin with, I started kind of gridding up paper and trying to put splats in grids and, you know, try and um, make it more organised. And, and it sort of didn't really work. I think what is really great about these pieces is they have a certain amount of spontaneity to them. And, and you really have to be in the moment. You've got to, you can't predict exactly what's going to happen. So unlike the other paintings, which are much more, um, you know, the, the beat and the pulse of them is much more moderated. It, the, it's much more kind of pre-planned. These are very spontaneous and, you know, I just have to react to what's kind of being made at that particular time. But I love the energy in them. And I think, um, as you say, they make a really nice juxtaposition with the other pieces. I like mm. the fact that they're on paper. And I mean, maybe because of the lockdown situation and because I was in the studio on my own, I started to make paintings which were much more sort of human scale and you know these were they're, they're quite large these pieces they're about five and a half feet by four and a half feet wide but that's kind of you know not far from my size you know I'm a bit taller but you know so I could really move them around in the studio on my own and work on them on my own and that was also really important and I think um you know the the, the genesis of the show really changed around this point because I realized that it was, it was so unpredictable trying to get people in to help and to, to make things with me that I really needed to think about scale. So I talked to Mariska a lot about, you know, what the show was going to be before in 2019. And the idea was to have, say, maybe three monumental paintings. And then we start to realize actually that just wasn't going to happen. So something, I, I kind of felt this, it's actually quite reflective of the moment, actually having something which is much more human scale as well. So a lot of the pieces in the, sh in the show really have just been made by me on my own and um, people coming in occasionally to help mix paint and, and uh, things like that. But I think that sort of sense of the, you know, slightly smaller scale down um, work just sort of seems to be really appropriate at the moment. Yeah, that makes sense actually um, in this weird time that, you know, you, you had to adapt to that. Um, I wondered, um, I mean, now is perhaps a good time to talk about your process because anyone looking at your stripe works um, must be curious, I think, about how you're able to achieve those incredibly straight rivulets. I, I'm not sure if everyone realizes even that those are done by hand without using masking tape as has been traditional for artists. And I wonder, Molly, perhaps you could just go back to one of those, um, some of the, the stripe paintings, because, um, thank you, because I think if, if Ian, if you could just quickly explain how you, you go about creating these, it's so extraordinary. Well, they, I mean, the idea came from a studio accident, which is um, also sort of quite an important part of my you know, working uh, philosophy and just the way that I adapt to, to, to things. But um, these particular paintings are made by pouring liquid lines of colour paint down a, a panel um, or metal sheet, which is uh, bent uh, at a certain point and, it, and it's bent onto the floor. So the metal is actually really, really thin and, and very light often. It's almost as light as paper. And it means that I can pour very, very straight lines of colour um, very accurately um, by using a syringe. 
And it sounds like a kind of a, a weird thing to do, but in a, in a way, if you think the syringe is actually perfectly designed to put specific amount of liquid at a certain point and to do it very accurately. So in a way, it's been perfectly designed for, for something, you know, for the way that I work. But what I noticed when I was first, when I first started making these pieces was that the paint kind of, I could pour it incredibly straight actually without not too much effort. And then paints also kind of pulled and puddled on the floor as almost a, as, a, as a secondary part of the process. And that was also really dynamic. And it created this incredible paradox between these very um, straight lines and then this kind of much more organic section at the bottom. And I really like that dynamic. And it's the sort of thing that you can't invent actually. I think that's what makes it really interesting. You know, uh, I think visually it makes a lot of sense, but when you try and explain it um, as, a, as a sort of a visual form, it, it sounds kind of, it, it doesn't really kind of, you don't really comprehend it in the same way, but visually it actually makes a lot of sense, this idea of structure and then how structure is breaking down, you know, fluidity and playing around with chaos and, you know, and, and, uh, and also sort of choreographing color. So for example, this painting is, is actually mirrored um, so I start off pouring paint from the middle of the, of the painting and then and then colour sequences sort of spread out from uh, from the middle uh, and I try and match that really, really accurately so it has a sort of symmetry to it as well. So I, I think these things, are, uh, I, I like this idea of, you know, playing around with something like symmetry but then also it having a chaotic element to it as well. Uh, and I've how always... Much, um, I was just wondering with that, how much room for improvisation is there? in in the way that painting will turn out in this particular painting not very much so a lot of it's been a lot of those decisions have been made prior to this painting being made you know i'll, I'll do a number of sort of smaller color studies even in this case quite a big you know almost full scale color study to, to actually get it kind of working in a way that i really like and this painting has been done in one sort of sitting so i, I got up you know and got to the studio about half past eight i was painting by nine and then I probably finished it about eight o'clock at night. So it's kind of done in one sort of sitting. And I think that kind of being able, the intensity of it, the sort of concentration, being able to put, you know, pour lines where they're so sort of, they have to be so sort of precisely gauged. And then for me to keep my focus is, is quite a sort of mental effort actually. And I think that's why I like maybe having a break playing the guitar because it just keeps that focus going. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it sort of also conveys that intensity to it as well. It sort of carries a bit of that in, its, um, in, the, in the way that it's finished. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, and so if we go back to the beginning to look at how you got to this sophisticated technique, um, going back to Goldsmiths College of Art in the late 1980s, what was it like as a painter, given all the talk of the death of painting at that time? I mean, it was, Goldsmiths was uh, just a brilliant art college. Um, I, I went, the, uh, when I went to do my interview, someone, it was the sort of degree show time and someone was firing eggs out of a cannon from the top floor and they were like, they were a textile student and it was just totally bonkers. And I thought, this is a brilliant place to go. I mean, you know, they're just breaking rules. And it just felt like you could experiment, you could do anything you wanted. As a, as a it was very unusual in that you didn't have to, uh, specialise in either being a painter or a sculptor, you know, you could, um, you could sort of mix disciplines and that at the time was, I mean, it sounds really obvious now, but actually that was very unusual. Normally you had to sort of uh, dedicate yourself to one particular form. So it's much more in kin and aligned with actually what was happening in galleries and, and in contemporary art. Um, and, you know, there were some really great students there, it was very dynamic and, you know, I had, a, I, I really, really enjoyed it. And, um, but as far as the conversation about his painting dead is, is, was going on, I mean, I just, I just kind of thought that was a bit nuts really, because, you know, if you go into the National Gallery or go around, you know, galleries and you see art and you see paintings and just realise what a rich vocabulary it is and how it constantly reinvents itself. And I think that was, that's really the point is that, you know, at a certain, at a certain time, a, a, a sort of an attitude to painting has to change, you know, and then something new will happen. And you just see it through the course of art history, how a particular attitude or a sort of movement kind of runs out of steam and then something else comes in its place. And that's just what I, I was thinking was going to happen. So I kind of thought that was a bit of a, a sort of redundant argument anyway. And I was surrounded by people who were making really interesting uh, paintings and sculptures and, and just doing all sorts of stuff so it, I just didn't think it mattered um, yeah. 
But so, you were you you kind of did end up taking quite the conceptual approach to painting, which moved the moved the conversation forward, actually, didn't it? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I just kind of felt my way with what I was trying to do, and I, I I got quite confused actually about a lot of the rhetoric about you know that was happening at the time. And, you know, I got, I mean, I, in my first year, I'd been, you know, a bit of a sort of golden boy. And then I'd gone, in my second year, I basically just found, discovered London and gone to sort of nightclubs and gone a bit wild. And then I thought, oh, well, it's got to my third year now, so I better sort of start, you know, kind of working uh, again. And, um, but my first term was just dreadful and I, I just really got lost. So I thought, okay, well, I better go and I'll just spend the Christmas holiday in my studio. And so, and I, um, yeah, there's a picture of me in my studio and I just started thinking, you know what, I've got to, I, I just, I don't know what to paint. And I was surrounded by paint pots in my studio. So I started um, just painting them and uh, the paint pots had these, all of these drips um, on, on the side of them. So I think this, this particular image we're looking at is quite interesting because this is on the left is one of these first paint pot paintings. So it's kind of done very, very quickly and, you know, with minimum sort of maximum efficiency, if you like, you know, very, very sketchily and, and allowing the drips of paint to mimic the drips on the side of the pot. And then the painting you see on the right is I'm just sort of painting the ellipses and, and allowing the drips to kind of, you know, become take over the painting. And over a period of weeks and months, actually, the, the sort of the way that the paint was flowing, the idea of gravity, this idea of materials became much more important. So I sort of dropped the, the kind of figurative nature of the paintings and started working uh, in a, a much more abstract way in incorporating movement. And, and I changed the materials I was working. I started using a lot of household materials, which sort of coincidentally drip and pour and are much more fluid. So, um, you know, so, so that was really what was going on there. And, you know, it was, um, it was I was very, very fortunate because um, I just seem to, it just seemed to pull a lot of different elements of my work together. You know, this sort of idea of kind of stripping abstraction back actually to something very, very basic. So, you know, the idea of painting a paint pot was, it was in order to do something so simple. It was almost like kind of me hitting ground zero, you know, just starting from the beginning again with what I, what, what painting could be and just looking at what painting could be. And I was, I also had some tutors that were encouraging me to look at a lot of contemporary art. And so I was kind of like looking at lots of, um, you know, American painting as well, which was also probably quite unusual. And a lot of my tutors at the time were very, um, you know, kind of couldn't, didn't really understand what on earth I was doing, you know, because I was looking at books about Jackson Pollock and Alan Frankenthaler and Agnes Martin and, you know, all sorts of different stuff. But I guess, you know, what I was trying to do was just to take, painting back to really, really, really simple gestures. And some of the pictures we're looking at now will be sort of a couple of years later in my studio in London. I've left college by then, but I'm sort of starting to pour paint in very simple shapes. In fact, this painting here is kind of made up with matte and gloss paint so that they're kind of using the reflective qualities of painting and actually taking colour completely out um, of, of my um, sort of use at this particular time altogether so that all the paintings were just about light and the way light hits the surface. Um, and around about this time I, you know, I, I, I mean I was taken on by a quite famous gallery in London and, you know, as you, I think Riska mentioned earlier, I, I sort of, you know, had a sort of Terminite, uh, Turner Prize nomination. So, you know, there's lots of different things going on, um, you know, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's sort of really exciting time, I guess. But it's quite rare, isn't it, for a, someone at that age, you know, what, what, how old were you, 21 or something, when you finished Goldsmith, your entire degree show was bought by Leslie Waddington, a, a veteran uh, gallerist. And, you know, that's, that's a really huge deal for someone at that age to, I guess, you found your voice so early. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it was really, um, it was... Uh, I think, you know, he was really struck by my paintings. He, he'd worked with a lot of American artists, um, particularly Morris Lewis. And I think he saw, you know, a connection there, um, and, you know, the way that I was pouring paint. Um, and, and he did it in a really nice way. He bought my um, degree show. He, um, but he sort of said, look, you know, what, what I think it, it, it can work this or it could really not go well at all. And we might just not get on. 
So what I'll do is I'll buy a, a, um, you know, five thousand pounds worth of paintings off you a year for the next two two years, and we will see, you know, like if we like each other and and how things go, and um, you know, and that was fine. And I was getting, you know, freeze to happen, and there was kind of other people starting to be interested in the paintings. And then I just thought, you know, I've had enough of this. I've, I've been working with this guy for two years. I'm just gonna just gonna really blow his socks off. I'm gonna make it impossible for him to not give me a show now. So I just, I invited him to the studio and I'd been working for about six months and then made loads of just massive paintings. Um, there was one back there of a white painting with these sort of black dots on it and just sort of sprinkles of, of uh, kind of, of paint and, you know, I mean, just all sorts of different stuff. And um, it just really, you know, and he, he just kind of left the studio and said, yeah, yeah, you know, you've got a show in September. And, um, you know, and uh, yeah, I was just very fortunate, but I, I kind of, I don't know why, I just sort of had this kind of belief that something was going to happen. I, I do not know where it came from, obviously. <laughs> but I just sort of, I, I just kind of followed my nose a bit with it. And I, I thought, maybe I, I just thought this was such a good moment. You know, like everything was aligned, the stars were aligned, the gallery yeah. was there, you know, there was interest, there was interest in young artists. I just didn't think as well that there was ever going to be such a good moment. And I just really had to kind of go for it. And, you know, if, if I was going to try and, you know, make an impact, this was going to be the right moment. And, um, you know, and, 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 and some things kind of went wrong. I mean, I, for the first show, I had lunch with Leslie and um, he's one of the directors from the gallery. And we talked through where all the paintings were going to go in the, in the exhibition. And, um, and I realised, you know, halfway through this lunch that I just didn't have enough work. I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? So I we finished the, the lunch, I put on my poker face and I phoned up um, Sue and I just said, look, can you come down to the studio and help me paint? Um, I've got to get, like, prepare a whole load of uh, paintings and canvases and stuff and, you know, we've just got to get a whole load of stuff together. So she, I bought a massive roll of canvas and, you know, we prepared a whole load of paintings, about 14 canvases, got them ready. I made these very, very simple paintings with really pared down shapes, which I've just, just about started to make. And then fortuitously, Leslie decided to do a sort of a, a kind of a, an emergency studio visit and see what was going on. And he walked in and waded through all this paint in my studio. And, and but he loved it. So it was good. It was um, everything. I was just like, phew, you know, managed to make that happen. That's um, fantastic. It's, yeah. yeah. It's the whatever it is, the um, exuberance of you, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, can we just really quickly, just very quickly run back to Freeze and just um, find, I wanted you to just ask your experience of it, because obviously you were then, in that case, kind of the superstar um, of that show. You had already been brought up by Leslie and um, you, you already were, things were happening fast for you. Um, so were you, how did you get involved in it? How did you well, know Damien? Well, Freeze was, um, I mean, you know, there was a, th these were all students from Goldsmiths and um, I'd already agree agreed to be um, in Freeze uh, prior to, to um, Leslie sort of buying the, the work from my show. So, you know, I wanted to take part in it. And, um, and I, I, you know, I think that um, it, was, it was interesting because other, other, I mean, you know, Michael Landy and also Gary Hume had some ga a gallery interest as well from a, from a, a gallerist called Carlson Schubert. So mm -hmm. I think the other people in the exhibition realised that this was a really, really good platform and a really serious platform for them to actually get recognition, um, you know, and to, 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 for, for people to come and see the show. I mean, as it actually happened, you know, the first exhibition, the one that I was in, had very little traffic really, you know, we would, it, we all had to share the invigilation and, you know, you'd wait there all day and then, you know, a man and his dog would turn up and it was, it was pretty depressing, frankly, but little by little they started to get, you know, um, a sort of, uh, a kind of, you know, whisper started and um, the second exhibition, oh, and it was only supposed to be two to begin with, you know, had a lot more traffic, a lot more people went to see it. And we learned a lot as a group, actually, that the second exhibition was much better than the one that I was in. You know, I mean, we were still sort of installing things about 10 minutes before the show opened the first time round, and it much better sorted out the second time. And then Damien decided to do a third exhibition, and that one um, somehow got, um, uh, I think Matthew Collins came and did a film for The Late Show on it. So it started to get, you know, a lot more recognition, and I think people really started to wake up to it. So the things kind of happened simultaneously. I mean, actually, Leslie didn't really want me to take part in Freeze. 
um, kind of um, ironic now, you know, thinking about it. So, but you know, I, th I think also people, you know, we all helped each other. I mean, I helped Damien uh, kind of paint all of his boxes, which were installed in the ceiling. Spent a whole day carefully arranging them with him, and you know, it looked great. And then I came in the next day, and he decided to take it all down, and move it around, and put it in a different order. But, oh, thanks very much, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but it was, um, you know, it was, it was interesting, and it was. You know, the building was a mess. It was, um, but I guess we just kind of felt that, you know, we could, things could happen and, you know, we could shake things up a bit. And I, I don't know, we just sort of, we just kind of did it. Yeah. And you, um, I mean, just going back to what you were saying about experimenting and we, we saw there was a picture there that you had um, a, a bit further on about that you've done using a nail just a <clears> tiny <throat> nail to, to apply paint to your canvas. And you did things like, uh, using an electric fan, which must have been very messy. Um, yeah. Can you talk us through some of the processes that you've sort of invented as ways of applying paint to canvas or to boards to uh, in your quest for, I guess, uh, you know, the, the least uh, the, the least gestural markings you can make? Well, this one, I mean, was sort of partly um inspired by um, wanting to make a very big painting and using sort of really minimal means. So it's actually made, it's called, uh, you know, this series of paintings was called From the Bottom to the Top. So it's a kind of gesture of me lifting paint from the bottom to the top. And it was also kind of a reference to the fact that I was at the bottom of the pile wanting to get to the top as well. So there was part of me that was kind of playing around with that. And, you know, I was just pretty skint at the time, um, you know, didn't have much money. And I was just trying to make the biggest painting that I possibly could with the smallest amount of paint. And, you know, that, that was really the basic, you know, I, idea behind this painting. And, um, but it has a lot of energy to it. It's almost, you know, I'm, I'm really fond of it because it, it kind of, you know, it's just so simple. And yet it's actually quite a lot of complexity to it. And like all your work has, all your work has a definite energy. That's, def that's one thing you, you, that is undeniable. Your, your work has this real energy to it. And yet you don't use a paintbrush at all. I wondered what, what was it that was such an anathema about using a paintbrush for you? I, I just kind of felt that the, the more sort of the more I kind of distance I got from the paintings in the sense that, you know, I'm not actually physically painting, you know, using a brush or making marks, mm -hmm. the more they felt like me. And also the more sort of expansive they were, the more physical, ironically, the more physical they became because yeah. I was or you know dripping lines or whatever um i mean i think you know some of the clips maybe we've got here that there might be one of me kind of um using a, a sort of a tipping machine i think it's called tip painting so why don't we have a look at that i mean this is sort of inspired by um you know dumper trucks and um you know kind of me just seeing how um you know kind of the way that a dumper truck would just tip kind of material um out and um you know and I, and I kind of just thought that that's a great idea for a painting <laughs> yeah so, but it's incredibly physical and in that you know it is um you know kind of a, a sort of a messy thing but it but it's also very dynamic and um and then i would what i would do it was like once that kind of um that section had dried as i would build it up in layers and put different layers of, of color over the top and so there was a certain, there was, as well as it being very dynamic, there was also a lot of precision to it as well. So the kind of gestures are very physical, but there's also a lot of control to them too. And sometimes, they, I mean, this, this particular series of paintings, they, um, you know, I stand the painting up and sometimes the kind of the material will just miss the surface. And, uh, you know, you get very sort of big splashes of paint hitting the floor. There's one, a nice one actually, Molly, could, could you show the one of, um, before the stripe one? Could we just have a look at the, all right. Can we have a look at the circle one we made, please? The magenta and black one. And this am I right in thinking that you were inspired by pancake flipping for this with this? Didn't yeah. you mention it to me? I mean, you know, I've made some sort of, you know, I've been uh, making some food at home and, um, you know, and I was just sort of struck by the idea of like turning, uh, you know, uh, something upside down and, you know, this idea of spinning and flipping. Can you just play that one again? So I, I really like it. Um, I mean, you know, and it was quite a lot of control in this to be able to sort of pour a shape and then to turn it upside down, let the paint come off and then to flip it back over. 
And then because and again, you're using a, a, a watering can, am I right? It looks like to, to control the first sort of like the first yeah. surface, yeah, to, so that I could kind of make sure that it was quite even um, as it yeah. came out of the, out of the source. Um, but the paint itself is a household paint, so when you turn it back over, it would kind of it would actually the surface would reform and become very very smooth. So again, mm -hmm. just really really simple ideas. They'd often take quite a long time to perhaps to practice and rehearse. So it's quite a lot of um, you know kind of planning goes into them and just sort of uh, you know getting the surfaces right and stuff. But once once I got my handle on you know how a certain series of paintings was going to work. Then it then it became quite sort of simple and straightforward. Mm -hmm. So so you went we had we've had the arches and those amazing circles and then you introduced more color and you also and then around about two thousand and four I think you you really you went back to your stripes and really honed that. Um, could you um, talk a bit about how that? series came about because you you had a, a really important commission for Warwick University didn't you? Yeah this uh, I mean Molly's just playing a clip now of me making a stripe painting but what had happened is that I'd um, yeah I mean I'd, I'd sort of main um, I'd kind of made some stripes in the sort of uh, um, kind of mid 90s early 90s and I, and I was quite young at the time and I just sort of felt that um, you know that there was going to be um, you know, there's a lot more things to do really with the painting. So here's a couple of horde paintings with arches. Molly, if you just flick on a bit further, I think we'll find there's some other ones. These were sort of playing around with different coloured surfaces and playing around with, uh, you know, the arch shapes and the, the simple, that's a circle painting being poured there. But this painting here, I think is um, a good one to stop on now. Um, and basically I, I'd, I just kind of felt in my early twenties that I, you know, it was just too, too soon to sort of um, really hone down that long on one particular body of work. Um, and, you know, before I stopped doing it, I'd started painting on walls and I was really interested in the idea of architecture, but also of like how I could, you know, paint on a wall. In fact, I was often testing paints on a wall just to see how they would run. So I started thinking, well, actually, you know, that could be really interesting. And then Sue and I took a, a trip to Venice uh, and to Florence rather, and we, we saw a whole load of frescoes in Italy. And we were just really, you know, absolutely blown away by, you know, frescoes and just all the churches and things. And I came back to London and I, and I started to feel like my process was getting quite slow. I was using, uh, working a lot on panels and uh, gloss paints take sometimes a long time to dry in between layers. So I wanted to do something a bit more immediate and quicker. So I started thinking about, you know, how I could look at the stripes again, how I could sort of play around with them. And I just started you know, painting on some walls and playing around with different color sequences. And um, this painting is uh, actually at the Tate. This this bit here is a uh, um, in the next clip, the next slide. What it's going to show is that's this is a detail from Warwick University. So these were sort of like um, commissions and, and made around about 2000, 2004. And I really started to, to sort of play around with scale. So this this particular painting is about thirty five feet um wide and by about 20 feet high and then the next painting this is a, another really sort of major commission that i got was at um, southwark street in london and it took me quite a long time to actually do this uh, painting to to get the planning permission needed it, there was a lot of sort of background um kind of research needed to make this work because it's underneath the bridge in london um, but it's sort of a, a whopper. It's like a huge scale. It's like um, you know, 150. And what is the scale exactly? Well, it's 150 foot long, which is pretty big for painting. Incredible. Um, <laughs> thank you. <Yeah>. And uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it's uh, you know, it's one of the largest sort of permanent artworks in London. So it's a it's a real sort of big thing to have pulled off. But it but it also kind of really confirmed it in me that I you know, that I needed to sort of hone down on the body of work that I wanted. I, I'd spent quite a lot of time playing around with lots of different uh, styles and I just actually wanted to, to sort of focus on one particular body of work for a longer period of time and actually enjoy the sort of slow shifts. I think what I felt happened as well was that every time I changed my work, sometimes stylistically quite a lot, even though a lot of critics and you know, gallery people could see, you know, the consistency and the ideas and, and the themes that were running through them. 
a, a sort of a more general, a wider audience just seemed to get lost every time. So I felt like I, I partly needed to, to, you know, be aware of that audience and actually bring it more with me as I kind of made shifts in the work. Um, and, you know, I just thought I needed to slow down a bit as well. I just needed to sort of like concentrate on this body of work. I thought there was a lot to kind of uh, get out of it and to play out of it. So, um, and, and that was actually quite strange. You know, people were very, very critical of that at the time. I think they just thought, you know, why, why have you stopped changing every three years? And, and it actually, that in itself was kind of a weird experience, actually like saying, no, I'm just going to do this for a bit. And, um, you know, there was quite a lot of, you know, uh, of resistance to, to that as, a, as an idea as well, funnily enough. Yeah, but um, I mean, although like someone like Agnes Martin, you've really, really explored and delved and, and taken tangents and, you know, there's so much variation in those striped works anyway. It's, it's not a homogenous body. I mean, there's, there's an incredible lot of variety within what you've done. Um, can we look at your, there's a very significant commission that you did in 2017 for the Venice Biennale that you had from Swatch. And that was another really large, important work. I remember seeing it myself, actually, when I was there. It was stunning. Thank you. I mean, it was, this was a, um, you know, it's a really good opportunity to kind of present something in, in a public space. And I'm really, you know, these are some of the, the projects that I enjoy the most, actually, when, when you know, art, and painting kind of goes out into the public realm and um you know this was particularly uh challenging because this painting had to be situated outside it wasn't going to have a normal gallery um sort of context to it it was going to be you know viewed by a lot of people um but it's going to have minimal sort of protection from the element so it was it was i, I planned on making it in my studio and then installing it in venice um, and you know, Venice is a uh, is it's four seasons in a day. You know, we we were installing you. There'd be floods there. It'd get incredibly hot. It would start raining. Then it would go incredibly hot again. You know, it was very very complicated um, sort of environment to work in. Um, and this particular painting's kind of got a repeated sequence of colours. So if you can see, it kind of goes from hot into kind of uh, reds and then into blues and then that's repeated again. So it's got this. It's almost like a kind of double rainbow. It gives it a sort of a structure and a kind of, uh, sort of a solidity, I guess, in a way. It gives it some sort of um, something that breaks up the randomness of the colour and the uh, of the mark making. Um, the floor of it um, is very dramatic. It's got this incredible sort of flooding, pooling. Um, actually, if, if you want, if you just go back a couple of a couple of slides, please, for the next one. That's it. That's great. And you can see, you know, it's really rich and complicated, this sort of marbling on the floor. So this was part of the painting as well. Um, and it was, what was really nice was that people, I think because they've been to see all the, the pavilions in Venice and they've been around the sort of more traditional uh, sort of art venues, if you like, it, you know, going outside and then seeing this painting, people just reacted to it in a really different way. They were dancing in front of it, people were having a photograph taken in front of it. There was thousands of Instagram posts and videos of people doing stuff. It was brilliant. You know, and I, I really was struck by the fact that people, you know, reacted to it in such a different way because it was not in this kind of classical venue. And it was just yeah. really spontaneous. So it was, you know, it was fantastic. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Wow. And then you also did an interesting interve intervention for the facade of a building on Oxford Street with the media company W1 Curates. Um, sorry to jump forward, but it's another example of this way that you've explored different, different ways of, um, of, of projecting your lines, your stripes. You've taken it into different sort of realms and different forms. Yeah, I mean, I started sort of experimenting with um, imploring kind of sheets of paint. I mean, Molly, is there poss possible that you could just share the film of this, actually? That'd be really good to see. Um, and, you know, there's, uh, uh, I, mean, I was experimenting in the studio and I realised that um, if I poured paint through this series of tubes, um, I could actually sort of form a kind of a sheet of paint. And, um, and then I managed to persuade a, a sort of company to come and, and film me doing this. So we've got these kind of cascades of paint. Um, mm -hmm which we then were able to sort of put together into a, into a sort of uh, a kind of a, a file and 
you know, find a way of kind of projecting them onto buildings. And, you know, I was, yeah, I think it's really exciting because it takes the, the painting out into, a, into another dimension. It takes it into time. And also we were able to play around with different color shifts and so on. So, yeah, that's something that I want to experiment a lot more with. And I think, you know, when, you, when you're kind of making, or if you're interested in the relationship between art and architecture, being able to sort of paint on buildings sometimes can be a really, really difficult thing to do. And even though I've done projects like this, you know, Molly facade, which is like a banner, you know, the idea of projecting onto buildings or, or using video uh, techniques and things seems to sort of bring, you know, painting sort of into a, into, you know, a very contemporary realm, really. And, um, you know, this, uh, I can I can sort of see it can go in lots of different directions now as well. Well, you've already started to become more sculptural anyway by bringing at the bottom. You know, when you're doing your puddling, you're already bringing the work into the viewer's space. So there's already a three dimension aspect to the work. Um, but this brings me um, to some of your fantasy projects that oh. you've created. Um, because talking about the architectural, can we have a look at those? Yeah, the, some fabulous stripes running down the, the mat. Right? Yeah, well, this is also a great fun thing to do. I mean, it happened really because I started coming up with, I, I had this idea for, for my team over lockdown because they were, you know, having to work remotely at home. And I just thought that, you know, I really need to find things to keep them motivated and keep them engaged. And I was trying to say to them, look, you know, we can't go physically anywhere to work, a lot of these places, but that's, let's sort of like have this series of fantasy projects so we can we can kind of just dream about projects that we might do. Mm. And of course the Met is one of the most famous, you know, museums in the world. So it, as you can see, this is my fabstraction show and um, starting off with a whole load of paint down their steps. And um, and I'm actually trying to sort of make something like this happen in a, in a museum in Italy. But um, yeah, they, they, they were kind of really great fun. And I think, you know, this was um, Tate Modern uh, this is a takeover project for Tate Modern down their, down their entrance. And here we've sort of poured paint down, uh, down the side. And I think the point was really just, you know, even though there's such, such a horrible thing like this pandemic, you know, it's happened, was to try and kind of be imaginative, to try and sort of, you know, take a, a terrible series of circumstances and, and to sort of, you know, to try and work with it in a way and, and to sort of see what, you know, we could do as a studio team. And, You've you know, got one um, with the Guggenheim too, haven't you? Can yeah, I'm not sure we got that on this uh, series, but yeah, we, that was one of the first ones we did. Oh, right, um, yeah. I actually, I sort of also kind of tried to persuade them to do one on the Empire State Building. So the great thing about fantasy is that, you know, you're not going to limit it to what anybody will let you do on their building. But I think it also just kind of means that you start dreaming and thinking in a different way and thinking about scale and, you know, kind of what's appropriate. and. The other thing that's happened is that, you know, some of the guys in my team are, are really good with Photoshop and kind of this idea of images. And as we've been able to sort of then, you know, some people have seen these and asked, well, could we, could we do something like this? Could we replicate it in a, in a, you know, in a specific site? So we've been able to use this, these ideas and, and kind of take them into, into another place. So, so hopefully next year we'll be able to, to sort of see some of these things sort of taking shape uh, in reality, which would be really nice. Well, it's not beyond the realms of possibility anyway. I mean, you've already had your stripes, your designs put on the side of, um, on aeroplane fins, haven't you? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we've kind of tried to sort of take over as much as possible. <laughs> you know. Davenport takeover. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, in a, in a very elegant and nice way. But um, no, I think that's kind of, you know, that, that's where we are at the moment, you know, with all the, all the things that, you know, we've been working on in the studio. And um, yeah, so uh, I think that, that kind of covers a lot of uh, yeah. where we're um, Can we just, you mentioned that the project in Italy, what else have you got in the pipeline um, just ahead? Well, this particular project is, um, you know, is uh, in, a, in a museum called the Cloister de, de Bramante, and it's designed by Bramante, who's an Italian architect. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully that's gonna happen next um, uh, autumn. And it's going to, we want to try and sort of replicate something similar to the Met, um, the uh, stripes that we, we did down the stairs. Um, another project is hopefully at the Imperial College in London, and I've been working with them throughout the sort of pandemic, um, having, because they're, they're sort of doing a lot of um, exp uh, exploration and investigations into people's mental health. So they've, 
kind of we're uh, having a dialogue about like what I can do in in the uh, in the college on the glass facade, um, you know, which would be a sort of a temporary project probably, uh, and hopefully that's going to happen next June, uh, twenty one, um, and and to coincide with the um, Arts Week in uh, in the Exhibition Road, sort of around about June and July. Fantastic. Um... So lastly, I wanted to just ask what your 18-year-old self would have thought if he was shown on a crystal ball the future and could glimpse all that you've done to date. I think he'd have been horrified. He wanted me to be a pop star. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think, it, I think it would have been, uh, it was just a real shock. You know, I think it, you know, it's, it's a lot of sort of good luck has to happen, I think, for, for an artist. I mean, you know, the stars and the mood, everything has to sort of align. Uh, to get that kind of initial sort of like break that you need. But then also I think you have to be really, really resilient and really determined. I mean, it's sort of been up and down sort of, um, you know, career, I think like all artists experience, um, you know, but I, I think I'm incredibly fortunate and I think he would have probably seen that too. So, yeah, I think he'd have been pretty pleased and um, probably sort of wanted to have a beer together. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Ian. It's been absolutely fascinating hearing about your practice and process and the history of these magnificent works. Um, I'm sure many people listening have questions and there is, there is time for just a couple, but I wonder if we can go back to Mariska. Hey there. Hi. 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 I've, I've relocated. Um, <laughs> so I, I do have a couple of questions for some, for some folks who've been listening. Um, We'll circle back historically. Um, I think they were asking this at the time when you were having the conversation about um, your participation in Freeze and at Goldsmiths and whatnot. Um, you came of age amongst a very particular group of artists who all continue to be associated together over their career. Do you see any artists of that age now, or sorry, do you see any artists who are as, as the next generation of the YBA, or they're following through on particular ideas and ethoses behind that that group of artists I that think, are working now? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, you know, there's, there is sort of. It felt maybe a, a, for for a time it wasn't there wasn't much. I was kind of surprised actually that you know it didn't feel like there was a lot of things you know happened subsequently. Actually, kind of felt, seemed to fall a bit flat, and I, I kind of wondered why why that was. But now I feel like there's been enough time. I think there's just you know, a whole different generation facing a lot of different problems, facing a lot of different issues to the ones that we faced and, you know, having to figure out ways in which they can do that. I mean, it's very expensive to, to be, you know, to live in London, for example. So, you know, a lot of them are kind of moving out to different places out, 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 across the UK. Um, but, you know, I, th I think it, it, there's, there, there's some really interesting artists sort of emerging at the moment. Yeah, I think it's really healthy in the UK from that point of view. Um, uh, you know, I mean, f for us, I, I guess, you know, as, as a group of people, we were, we were quite loosely linked in the sense of like not having a shared aesthetic, you know, but we were very close friends, some of us, you know, and used to hang around and talk together and, you know, help each other out a lot as well. So I think there's a lot of mutual support. And we were told by a lot of our tutors that we were just dreadful. And <laughs> we were the worst year that <laughs> You know, so, so I think it was, it was just really funny. I think we, you know, um, well, that yeah. worked out well then. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all about, um, but you know, it, it was, yeah, I think, you know, you look back on it in hindsight and, and, and it kind of makes sense, but at the time you just sort of following, your nose, know, you don't really know what's going to happen to you. So you just kind of go, I think people just took, a, you know, just had a go. That was really the point. I mean, freeze itself was in an absolutely deserted part of London. It was a warehouse you know, in a kind of industrial wasteland and, and, you know, there was an anthrax factory over the road. I mean, it was just like, it was like the whole area had been completely nuked, you know, it wasn't sort of a pretty <laughs> thing. When you see that funny photograph of us with all those glasses of wine and it looks like we're at a wedding, if you flip the camera around 180 degrees, you see a very different sort of sight. So it, it was... Dead, dead dogs and industrial carnage. Nice. <laughs> um, the second question, we'll, we'll forward this right along, and it actually pertains to one of the works that's in our show and was also what you presented within Dallas Contemporary and in the Giardini, was how do you make those works that are on the floor with the, the cut, the laser cut aluminum, the panels that's on the floor? Well, the, the metal sheets that I paint on are really, really thin, and they're so thin they're, um, that, you know, you can actually cut them with a knife or, you know, with scissors, you can cut them with a blade. So what I tend to do is to work 
on the floor and, and have a uh, sorry on on the wall, but have a almost like a, a massive um, kind of layer of sheets laid out on the floor. And as the paint comes down and it, it's allowed to spread onto the floor, and when it's tacked up and it's dry enough, we just cut round um, those very thin metal sheets, and then we're able to sort of kind of lift them away from the painting and template them, and then cut a metal plate which fits that perfectly, and then we just glue it on to the uh, metal sheets, and they're kind of quite robust, really. And it means that we install and deinstall those paintings. And for example, at the moment, because for example, you know, I can't come to New York it's meant that we can make a painting in the gallery which looks like it's been made in the gallery it looks site specific so it kind of it, it's a practical element to it as well and it has a lot of um you know I, I like the drama of it it looks like it's been made in your space it looks like it, the liquid paint's gone down it so yeah. you know I saw people responded to in venice and they were kind of going it looks like it's still moving it looks like it's still wet you know so it, it, it has that feeling to it I think that's my kind of final question that I that somebody else has asked also of just how do you gauge that balance between complete control and just the total chaos of like liquid paint running all over the place. That seems to be what in every, you know, 25 years worth of, of making pictures that very, very delicate balance that you find. Do you leave it to chance or just to a certain extent? I mean, you know, it's, it's some some sort of processes are, are much more left to chance, and then and they sort of find their way. Each sort of each kind of group of paintings sort of needs a maybe a different set of um, judgments, you know, for like how how much mess there's going to be, or like how how much control you actually use once you get into them. But I think I was very lucky. I had a really good tutor when I was at college uh, called Michael Craig Martin. He's a really successful artist in his own right. And he just sort of, he, he once sort of said to me, you're just really good at using materials. You're just using them in a way that other people, you know, really struggle with it. And you just don't even know you're doing it. The weird thing is you just don't even know you're doing it, you know, and you really need to think about that. And it kind of completely confused me at the time. I didn't know what on earth he was talking about. <laughs> but I guess what he was sort of saying was that I needed to find a language which could exploit the things that I was just really good at. And, you know, and, and as soon as I kind of clocked that, then I think that it made a lot of sense for... You know how I developed as an artist so it meant that I was exploiting all the things that I you know just had a facility to do and I think you know a lot of people spend a long time trying to find those things and I, I just I just got given a, a glimpse into how to do it very very early on so I think that's why I had you know all that early success because it's just like someone was really pointing me in the right direction right from the very beginning that's what a really good art college is able to do is able to give people that place to kind of go no think about this you're great at that you know and um and but the other thing is you've got to listen to that you know and actually listen to what someone says and kind of take it on board and then you know how do you how do you make the most of that advice I hope that's well, question. i think that's it i think that answered it very nicely um yes. and with that i think we can sign out my thanks to, to you both thank you ian thank you elizabeth uh and thanks for everybody for for coming along and taking a listen um Please do come and see the show in its, in its remaining days and um, have a good holiday. I'll sign off and I'll sign out. Thanks, Mariska. Happy holidays. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks.